Dr. Susan Stewart, welcome back to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> it has. You were one of the first people that I ever interviewed. You were episode number nine. I was. On the mythic views of aging. And given that title, that's kind of suggestive of the book that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, had you already started the book at that point? No, I think it took a couple years for me to decide that I needed to write a book about it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, back then I remember you were doing some presentations, a uh, uh, slideshow kind of thing that right. uh, was very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And so it needed to be born into a book. It did, and I yeah. didn't want to write a book. They're yeah. very big. Yeah. So, um, but... I should probably let our audience know that we're longtime friends, yes. uh, uh, colleagues, uh, both in the psychology department at Sonoma State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first came, you were one of the kids. I was. <laughs> and now, now we're both uh, in later life. We which, are. Which is what we're going to be talking about mm -hmm. here. So uh, we kind of grew up together in some ways. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be talking about your book, Winter Graces, Winter's Graces, mm -hmm. uh, The Surprising Gifts of Later Life. And um, so congratulations on finally getting your book into print. Thank you. How many years was well, that process? I, I would say maybe close to 15. Okay. Yeah. yeah with, with time yeah. out for working. Oh, sure. And that's right. Raising You're grandkids work. part time, and yeah, but it spanned right. fifteen years. Okay. Yeah. So I suppose I should ask you how you came to write this book. Okay. Well, the short version is I kept running across the word crone. Yeah. And it's which is not it's not a great word. It has kind of a harsh crony is friendly crone not so much. And uh, the first time, it was when someone referred to an experience I told him about as a wonderful crone story. And I was only 54, and I, I didn't know what he was talking about, and I was a little... It was, it was hard to own that at that point, right? Very, very hard. I was comfortable being in midlife, but mm -hmm. old had not even crossed my yeah, mind yet. Yeah. And then it just, the crone kept dogging me, and... Um, so I began to read folk tales and see if I could find mm -hmm. any good ones, and I found wonderful old stories. I think the thing that pushed me to writing a book was when I found in the gerontology literature and medicine and development and then later neuroscience that the same things about the good news about old age that were reflected in these old stories were in the current literature. And at the same time, it's really obvious that our culture is not very friendly toward age. Yeah. And I think that causes a lot of suffering. Right. So at some point I just thought, you know, this is too important not, not to share with people. Yeah. So that's got something to do with what motivated you to write the book. Exactly. Because feeling like the culture needs some healing. Yes. And how we think of ourselves as we move into old age, older age. Yeah. 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 I know that you're... You, at least in the beginning, you were strongly influenced by Jungian thought, yes. Carl, the work of Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the archetype of the crone figures strongly in that world. But outside of that world, yes. <laughs> the crone is a very heavy thing to, to own. Yes, it's not our yeah. favorite image, yeah. the yeah. old woman. Yeah. One of the things that, just part of this back story was when I was first getting dogged by this archetype, I looked up crone in the dictionary, and it was horrible. It said a withered, witch-like old woman, and the derivation was probably an old Scots word for rotting flesh. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I just about quit before I yeah. even started. I yeah. thought, oh, I wanted nothing to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. So... How did the being in the process mm -hmm. of working with this concept, with this, all of this Im imagery, how did it impact your own image of aging? Mm -hmm. And particularly if you go back to when you started 15 years ago and mm -hmm. now. Okay, I'd say when I started 15 years ago, I, I was a midlife woman looking ahead for some good news that I actually wasn't sure I'd find any. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the stories began to really, uh, they were very inspiring, these women who were 
courageous, highly ingenious, very compassionate, wise. Um, From various folk tales various and myths and so myths, on. right. Yeah. And then the literature was saying similar things. That, w that was exciting. But I think it's maybe just been in the last five years, I'm 72, where I began to start to feel like it had really changed my view of myself. And I was owning old, mm -hmm. and I was grateful to be owning old. Yeah, so, it's the alternative. Well, it certainly does. <laughs> yeah. but, e but even more than that, there's so many wonderful things that go on developmentally as we age. Yeah. We're not as cute as we used to be. That's just the fact, most mm -hmm. of us, unless we have super bone structure mm -hmm. or something. But internally and relationally, there, there are so many gifts that are involved. So I would say it's profoundly changed my view of aging. Um, I feel, and I still, when I talk to friends, like not too long ago, I was speaking with a, a, an old colleague of ours and she said, but just don't, don't say old. Mm -hmm. And she's a very educated woman and very open-minded, but there's, there's such a stigma. So I feel like th for me, the stigma has really moved way away. Yeah. And um, so that's been an incredible gift yeah. to me. And uh, who do you have in mind as the reader of this book? Well, I think the people probably most in need of good news about growing older are people in midlife, maybe 50, 60, who are beginning to recognize their aging mm -hmm. and and have bought into the age of stereotypes and are in dread. Um, I've taught elders uh, classes in things like the gifts of age. One of them was with you, a tandem class. And it seems to me older people figure it out, <laughs> or a lot of them anyway, you know. Yeah. They stumble onto these gifts and they're living with the losses, but they're also coming into some of these graces of age themselves. Yeah. Even even that being said, I think for older people also to hear elders being uh, revered and respected is important. Yeah. yeah. And probably least interested would be young people who aren't thinking about old yet, because they have <laughs> a lot else on their plate. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, originally you were looking at, at women's myths and stories yes, and so right. on. Uh, what about men? Is this um, are they in your target audience at all? They this are. Book? They are. In yeah. fact, several men have read it and and resonate with it. So I, I it, they are. I think the there's some differences in the ways that women and men age, mm -hmm. and like for, for example, one of the big issues for women is lo losing our looks. Yes. Yeah. Because there's such an emphasis on how a woman looks right. as as equated with her value. And I think for men, there's more um, emphasis on your productive power and your income and your making sure you're not on the bottom of the totem pole. Yeah, so, <laughs> I can own that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there are some differences, but almost everything in the book, um, almost all of the graces of winter apply to men as well as women. Yeah, I, you know, I read the book and yeah. uh, as it was evolving, and I certainly was able to identify with it. So I would. I would underscore that as being yeah. the case. Yeah. Winter's Graces, uh, where did that title come from? Somehow, uh, maybe grace means something special to you, that's what I'm wondering. Because I don't normally think of those terms. The word grace? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't either. Oh. <laughs> so it, it came either from a dream. It came one morning when I woke up. Uh -huh. And I had been really wrestling with how to talk about good news about growing old yeah. without using the word old or the word aging or the word crone or all those other words yeah. that that send people running in the other direction and they say okay that's fine but i don't want to think about that so i think that was the impetus it was how i could talk about this in a way that didn't scare people mm -hmm. or put them off and the phrase came one morning as i woke up and i loved it that's perfect. Uh, you and I have been in dream groups right. over the years <laughs> yeah. together and, uh, you know, have tried to do our best to listen to our dreams and yes. learn from them. And how perfect that you get this. It really is a wonderful title. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's begin to dig into the book a bit, mm -hmm. and, um, and we'll sort of hit some of the highlights in uh, the various chapters. So one of the things that you write about as, as one of the graces or benefits of, mm -hmm. of aging is authenticity. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are, you know, that authenticity is such an important word. It's such a, a great thing, quality mm -hmm. to go for. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so where does authenticity come in here? Uh, well, for me, it's one of the two, if you, if you will, foundational graces. Mm. I think there are two upon which all the rest kind of grow and evolve. Really? Yeah. So I think of authenticity in later life as we get to come home to ourselves. And particularly for women, I, I think men are not encouraged to be who they are either mm -hmm. as young people. They're encouraged to look like they know what they're doing and yeah. take the reins of power. But as far as being connected to who they are, I think it's difficult for human beings. Yeah. yeah. But for women, I think, at least for my generation and older, it's I think a little less now. There's a, a lot of training we get as women to take care of other people's needs more than our own. Yeah. And in fact, to kind of lose track of who we are in the process. So it's a very sweet homecoming in later life. There's a, a shift, I think, that begins to happen around midlife where women start to care more about being at home in themselves than they care about pleasing other people. Yeah, yeah. Which is basically the beginning of authenticity caring more about being real and doing the things you need to do and the things you need to say versus ha being accepted or approved of. Yeah, so we're not putting as much effort in ha into how we look. Yes. Yeah, I, I certainly noticed that in myself that in the way that I dress, I may not put as much attention into right. it, etc. You know, mm -hmm. hey, if they don't like it, screw them. <laughs> sort of like that. Yeah. Sort of like that. <laughs> yeah. It, maybe this is more for men, but is a flip side or a, an aspect of authenticity as we get older crankiness? Or it could be perceived as crankiness? It could be. It's just shooting from the hip uh -huh. and not, not putting on airs as much. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, but I think there is a, well, we'll, be, we'll get to that later, okay. but I, I think there's one other dimension of, of um, authenticity for women, two of them. We come into our power, authentic power, not bossy, bully, domination power, but just, you know, living from the inside, yeah. and there's more of a self there to work with and speak from. Yeah. The other piece that I think applies equally to men and women is um, we let ourselves be audaciously who we are. That's one of the more enjoyable <laughs> aspects of getting yeah. old. That, that wonderful poem about when I'm old, an old woman, I'll wear a red hat and with purple that doesn't match and I'll gobble up all the samples in the grocery store. And <laughs> there is that sense uh -huh. of, and I think that can sometimes come across as crankiness. Yeah. I think maybe, too, what, you, what you're doing here is uh, these things may not all come automatically and in some way paint signposts for ideals to realize that we can aspire to yes. have these, to manifest these qualities yes. in our lives and yes. experience them. Yeah. Yes, I think they are developmental nudges and okay. we, we can ignore them, yeah. we can learn from them, we can aspire to them. It isn't automatic, but I do think there's something developmentally that is pushing us in these directions. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Jung said about any, any development in the soul, the psyche is working on our behalf to get more whole, more complete, more real. Okay. And we can work with that or we can completely ignore it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is kind of a continuation yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. So you say authenticity is one of two foundational yes. stones. What's yeah. the other one? Well, the other one is, and this is a, I don't know what to call this still, but it's in print, the book. So here we are, it's coming out. <sighs> self-transcending generosity. And it's a mm -hmm. mouthful. And I tried selfless generosity for a while, but that had connotations of self-sacrifice that, mm. especially for women, I didn't want to go there. Yeah. So the, the, this is a trend that's been observed by a number of gerontologists 
Um, there's a Swedish fellow named Tarnstam that talks about it as Jero transcendence or the old person's climbing over the ego mm -hmm. or the personal sense of self. And that there's a growing recognition of kinship with all of life, other people, other generations, mm -hmm. even ancestors, nature. Yeah, yeah. That is a kind of counterpoint. It's sort of like we grow into who we are and at the same time, we don't take ourselves, our little selves as seriously. Okay. And I think that's a little bit later. I think the authenticity starts dogging us in midlife, 40, 50. Mm -hmm. Jero transcendence, at least for me, um, has been a little bit of a later development, more 60s, 70s. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that everyone experiences that, but a lot of elders do. Yeah. So that sense of being part of the web of life, invested in creation and the human family, and it's a nice, um, you know, it offsets the taking yeah. oneself yeah. too seriously and getting yeah. too puffed up. Yeah, I also want to compliment you uh, in terms of saying how impressed I am that you went out of the uh, Jungian framework that originally, I think, kind of inspired you mm -hmm. to look into the science around gerontology yes. and other fields. Yeah. And so I really have to compliment you on that. I mean, I can see why it would take 15 years, yes. right? <laughs> it was growing like Topsy. It was. We start off here. But then, oh, what about this? What about what? this? What yeah. about that? Yeah. Yes, and not, not just, well, I guess this is fairly related to Jung, but spiritual traditions, yeah. which as academics we're, you know, warned about kind of not going there. <laughs> right. So it's a pretty eclectic pool of information, and I learned an enormous amount. Yeah, yeah, I'll um, bet. It yeah. sounds like you have. Yeah. And also I think it what maybe widens the appeal uh, uh, of your book to a broader set of readers. Like, mm -hmm. they don't have to be members of our cult. <laughs> no, they don't need to be Jungian, they don't yeah. need to be scientists, they don't need to be spiritual seekers, yeah, psychotherapists. Right? Yeah. Okay, okay yeah. good. And um, let's see, if we get into another of the graces here. Oh, courage is something that you write about. Yes. And, yeah. and I can certainly see that's in the mix, like, how can I be authentic if I don't have courage? I mean, that takes courage. It does. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you've written a whole chapter yeah. on generosity, on courage, courage. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think for in, the, in later life, there are examples of all kinds of courage, physical courage, where you risk your physical safety on behalf of others. I'm thinking of the... I think 250 Japanese elders that after the earthquake in 2011, when younger people were assigned to clean up the nuclear waste, 250 mm. elders said, no, let us go. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and interestingly, the government, I, I lost track of the story, but initially the reaction of the government was, no, our elders are too valuable, which is like, phew. That's such a... It's a different culture. <laughs> it's a very different culture. Yeah. So I think there are, in late life, even though we tend to think of ourselves as maybe not as fast or strong, there are examples of elders putting their lives on the line mm -hmm. on behalf of something important. Mm. Um, but I think the, the kind of courage that's m most pulled forth in late life is something people call personal courage, which is not so visible in public, and it's those situations we find ourselves in where day after day we need to find the willingness and strength to do something very hard like caretake a spouse with dementia, mm -hmm. um, agree to raise grandchildren whose parents can't take care of them, yeah. deal with our own maybe a health crisis where we need to, to live more from love and willingness than from fear and yeah, resistance. Yeah. So I think it's a big part of, in fact, for a while it was the third part of the foundation for me, because I think it's essential for everything else, that willingness to go toward what's important. Mm -hmm. And there's also another form of personal courage that Daniel Putnam has identified, he calls psychological courage, which is the willingness to face those wounded, limited, defended places in ourselves that 
inadvertently harm other people. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that is probably one of the keys that makes the difference between getting more cranky, rigid, defended, or more open and loving and caring as we age, okay. is that willingness to take stock of ourselves mm -hmm. and do yeah. something about the parts of us that are less than noble. Yeah, yeah, wow. Okay, you also speak about the grace of creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, do we get more creative as we grow older? Actually, or? there's some evidence that we do. Yeah. Uh, Gene Cohen's, he was a second generation gerontologist. His work with, he's written a beautiful book called, uh-oh, <laughs> I can't remember, but it's on creativity in late life. Oh, okay, and good. so he's found beautiful examples of older people, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, developing like the Granny Smith apple. The reason it's Granny is she was in her 80s when she developed this particular wonderful kind of apple. Hmm. So there is a sense that we get more creative, many of us, as we age. In fact, some elders are doing their most creative work in their later years. And I think that's partly a function of that not taking the self so seriously, not taking mistakes so seriously, that willingness to, sort of like you were when we were setting up the technology, I was not in creative mode. I was in, oh God, <laughs> uh, <laughs> will this ever work? Yeah. You just assume it will work and you take, we take as we age, I think, mistakes as opportunities to figure something out rather than a sign that we're a failure. You know, we don't personalize, I think, mm -hmm. as much. That mm -hmm. helps us be creative. Yeah. The thing that tipped me off to that was so many of these old stories, these old women and old men are very, very wily. They're, they're in life and death, horrible situations, usually with other people. And there's no way out that looks possible. And through indirect means and humor, they consistently come up with things oh, using very yeah. simple ingredients, uh -huh. you know, walnut juice and rice and things you you, yeah. you wouldn't think those could save the day, but they yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating because um, I don't think most of us know that literature that you're referring to. We haven't grown up with a lot of stories that uh, recognize the powers of aging. No, we don't. I yeah. grew up with wicked witches and ugly hags <laughs> right. that ate children after they fattened them up in cages. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. It's hard so, to get away from that. <laughs> yeah. So that that's a big change. Yeah. 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 Thankfully. Yeah. 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 And I'm realizing that there are places in our madly driven economy where there's some coming around to a valuing of age that uh, they're realizing that older employees have a mm -hmm. different perspective that they can bring to processes and so on. Yes, yes, because they've seen a whole lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as, as wonderful as fresh new energy is, so is experience. Yeah. It's self-serving, but I would like to see more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. In our society. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, and uh, contentment, that, that certainly sounds like a, uh, a wonderful thing to look forward to. You bet. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of literature on yeah. late life contentment. <clears throat> there's, uh, there have been a number of studies, and these are worldwide, so it's not just US okay. studies. That, that indicate there's a U-shaped curve for contentment through adult development. Mm -hmm. Fairly high in young adulthood, although there is a lot of stress for young people these days in particular. And then contentment tends to drop. Satisfaction with one's life, how one feels about oneself, tends to go down around hitting a nadir at about 50 and then slowly coming up to new heights in later life. Yeah. There's a beautiful TED talk by uh, Laura Carstensen from Stanford um, called Old People Are Happier, where she talks about mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah. There's just a, a coming to accept who it is we are, knowing we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. it, we recognize that we're good enough and not in a sort of, oh, well, it's good enough kind of way, but in a 
good enough, yeah. not perfect yeah. kind of way. Yeah. yeah. So contentment is one of those. I think it permeates a lot of the other graces. And in that um, being kinder toward ourselves, I think it encourages us to be more tolerant of other people's foibles. Mm -hmm. You know, there are moments where yeah. that's not true, but right. <laughs> in general, more, um, and, a, and a, a happiness, an ability to savor small moments. When we're rushing around as young people, we don't, we're going so fast, yeah. you know? Yeah. But we move a little slower as we age, and I think that's a gift. It may be a little frustrating at moments, but the ability to, to, to enjoy how a pear tastes mm -hmm. or how the clouds are looking in the evening. Yeah, yeah. And really derive joy from that. Right, right. And imagine as, uh, as our faculties begin to fail a bit, as we're more limited, it slows us down mm -hmm. and also helps us to appreciate what is available to us. Yes, and, yes. And that we, you know, if we can remember to keep our focus on that. Right, yeah, right. To really tune into nature or to the, the wonderful things, the qualities of people around us. Yes. And, and become aware of those. Mm -hmm. I think I can on the, you know, that at this point in my life that I'm experiencing more of that kind of uh, con contentment. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, Compassion. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about compassion. That's another topic in your book. Yeah. And it's a very big topic these days. Uh, yeah. The whole influence of mindfulness and, uh, and, and then compassion as an object for meditation and being mindful of and all of that. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of literature right, now. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the word literally means to suffer with. Passion mm. is suffer, mm. and calm is with. Okay. So um, I think partly because of this um, coming home to ourselves, and and our capacity for contentment regardless of circumstance, uh, compassion is um, in part being willing to be present with another person in their suffering, which is not easy. Right. And um, it also, even uneasier, harder, is it starts with the self, being present with our own suffering rather yeah. than beating ourselves up for being whatever, a wimp or too sensitive or, or whatever. So I think it's related to that um, ability to be present to uncomfortable emotions that contentment teaches us and to extend ourselves to people who are suffering and also to people who are suffering in an obnoxious way and and we often do that mm -hmm. you know I'm thinking of the the, the experience of driving these days and the, the degree of rage that's on the road uh, I was in uh, my car the other day with my two young grandchildren in back and <clears throat> I was I saw I was, it, it was a traffic jam Friday afternoon, and I put on my signal to pull into the left turn lane, and out of, out of I don't know where, this car comes speeding by and cut us off. And there was a woman in the car shouting at the top of her lungs oh at, my at me. Wow. And I don't think I did anything wrong. Yeah. You know, I don't think yeah. I was breaking any rules, except clearly this person was in a hurry, and I was in the way. Yeah. And my granddaughter, uh, after about a minute, said, Grandma, what's happening? And I realized she was really impacted by that, mm -hmm. you know, because her young children's hearts are wide open. Yeah. And so I, I watched the car as I followed it and finally turned left myself, speeding ahead, cutting off people, speeding to the next mm -hmm. light, getting stuck in a red light anyway. And then a few minutes later, she said, was she very angry? Yeah, yeah. And it just, um, it really touched me, recognizing that staying open or being open-hearted in a world that goes ballistic on a regular basis lately is a really difficult thing. Yeah. Yeah. And young children do that naturally. Uh -huh. And I think older children, people, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> begin to revisit that. And it's part of courage, too, being present to someone 
a homeless man I once stopped to give some money to. I thought I had some money, and I actually had 36 cents. <laughs> so, I, so I got up to him, and I, I said, I'm so sorry. I thought I had more. And he said, he said, everything helps, which is also what his sign said. And he said, you know, the hardest thing about being out here is that people look away. Yeah. And that's, I think that's a little version of compassion. You know, the willingness mm -hmm. to look at suffering in the world and not armor up. Yeah. You know, it doesn't yeah. mean necessarily doing anything other than looking and feeling and sending a good wish. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of compassion, I think, in later life. Yeah, yeah. You know, you were talking about the... Uh, uh, the child within, I guess, was somewhere in the story that you were mm -hmm. telling about mm -hmm. your grandchild. And I've been going to a exercise class for seniors. Yeah. And sometimes I think of it as kindergarten. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> that we're in kindergarten together and, you know, there's a teacher up there who's leading us through all these uh -huh. activities and, and uh, all older people and having many of the qualities that you're talking about. Yes. Yeah I, yeah. I always thought a gym would be like the last place that I would hang out, you know. And, right. And uh, <laughs> what I'm finding out is there is a, at this particular gym, mm -hmm. I've been told this is not true of all gyms, but probably because they offer this class for seniors, mm -hmm. it's a friendly place yes. where everybody's very friendly. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing there are a bunch of retired people there and this is sort of what they're doing. <laughs> yes. They go every every day mm -hmm. and say hi to the people that right. they know. And yes. And they're taking care of their health. Yeah. And being kind to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think also the other day I got stuck in the middle seat of my car. We were picnicking <laughs> in the back and there's these huge car seats and I climbed over and I kind of temporarily got oh, stuck God. upside down. Oh, no. And that was another moment where yeah. compassion for myself, because I can remember how agile I was. Yeah. I could have flipped out of that in a second and I couldn't. It took me some time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just you know, noticing how often, at least I, go bad on myself for being older in some, on some front. Mm -hmm. As much as I've learned about it mm -hmm. and the blessings of it, there are a lot of moments where I, there's, I notice the choice. Am I going to beat myself up yeah. or just kind of pat myself on the head? And yeah, it's a discipline. It is. And noticing the choice, that's the key thing. It so is. much of all of this. <laughs> you bet. Yeah, noticing yeah. the choice, yeah. that we have a choice. Yeah. So having talked about compassion, mm -hmm. you also have a, a chapter on necessary fierceness. And those sound like... <laughs> Don't they? Yeah. Yes. Are they opposites? Are they... Well, are they uh, Complimentary. I think they're complimentary, yeah. but I hope we go more with compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, this grace was a challenge for me. It, yeah. it took me a long time to recognize it as a grace at all, um, because I was raised to be a good girl mm -hmm. and nice. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. Good boy. Good boy, yeah. yeah. So um, necessary fierceness, I think of as um, a, a, a further extension of courage in very dire circumstances when gentler subtler methods have proved ineffective. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I really, as, as the years passed and once I'd recognized it as a grace and then the world seemed to be getting more and more aggressive, I really hesitated to include this, yeah. but I had to. Yeah. Because I think there is a real difference between um, the willingness to be fierce on behalf of something important, even no matter what it costs you, and vengeance or bullying or just nasty pushing each other out of the way. Yeah, yeah. So it's on behalf of the greater good. It can also be standing up for your own needs when you're being bullied by someone mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Um, or standing up for an ideal or a principle? Yes, which I think of as the big, the bigger picture. Yeah. 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 So there are many examples of elders um, taking a stand like the Abuelas um, decades ago when there was um, genocide going on in their country and they stood in the park and eventually mm -hmm. that led to the recognition 
that um, rounding up of people and locking them up for being dissidents was a violation of human rights. Yeah. So there are, there are moments when it's important. Little moments, too, I notice like as a grandmother saying no to a request that's like one too many or it's too much. Yeah. The importance of teaching um, that you can't always have what you want and that sharing is important and accepting no is important. I'm sure that can feel mean to grandchildren. Yeah. But I think it's part of doing, and that was much harder for me as a mother than it is as a grandmother. So doing the things that we need yeah. to do. Yeah, I have that experience as grandfather, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my wife and I both have that experience of looking at what our, what our children are doing in relation to child rearing. Yes. We have to restrain ourselves from you know, yes. uh, interfering in that, but yeah. at the same time trying to represent maybe, you know, grandparents have the luxury of being very giving and providing lots of space, but at the same time, we do need to teach something about the setting of limits. Yes. And uh, uh, our children don't always do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I didn't yeah. enough. Yeah. 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 So, so grandparents, this, being in this age group, that's important for the next generation, for the rearing of kids. It is. And some of the things I've read about, um, there's something called the grandmother effect. Okay. Not to leave grandpas out, but yeah. the grandmother effect. Uh, there's some research that suggests that children who have regular contact with their grandparents, um, that has what's called a gentling effect. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's it's the two sides of it. It's mm -hmm. It's the fierce side of no, because that's important. But also the, that we're slowed down and, and there's a, a natural affinity, I think, between especially young children and grandparents, that that's a worldwide thing. Yeah. Yeah. And part of that is we um, are present. We're able, because we're not rushing around in the same way, able to be present and really see and feel who they are and enjoy who they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, don't get us talking about our grandkids. No, that's right. right. We'll take a whole we'll time. To yes. here. Do I have some pictures to show you? <laughs> Actually, I do. <laughs> okay, and uh, another thing that you write about is simplicity. Yes, yes. There seems to be a natural paring down as we age, getting rid of stuff that mm -hmm. we've accumulated a lot of, some of us over 50 years of adulthood right, or whatever. Right, right. Uh, moving helps, but if you haven't moved and you've been in the same house, mm -hmm. you have a lot. Because of the recognition that we're all connected and that, um, and also the waning importance of stuff for a lot of yeah, elders. Yeah. There's a lot of paring down, giving away, recognizing someone could use this and mm -hmm. I don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also it's not just stuff, it's uh, the, the, it's the willingness and the necessity to weed out what isn't important. Mm -hmm. And because we change, involvements we've had that were super important aren't so much. And it, there's a real need to relinquish the things that aren't most important so we can use our limited time and energy for the things that most matter. Well said. And it includes some relationships sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the hardest, to just let those fade with as much kindness as we can. It may, it may not be that we cut people off or they cut us off, but just the, the truthful recognition that we're not as involved in each other's lives because we've grown in a different way. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of simplicity. And then the other is the, in, the intense need to focus on what matters. Mm -hmm. I think it's partly the awareness we are not going to live forever. Yeah. We can only do so much. And those unlived dreams, those unresolved places in our lives, for me, writing this book was an absolute must that I didn't even want to do. And every time I thought about <laughs> quitting, which was many times, yeah. I'd get to that place where I thought, I have to do this, and I don't even understand why. I was going to say because? Well, it, because at the beginning I didn't even know, except I felt like this old lady had been tracking me, and I had said <laughs> yes, and I was going to keep a promise to an yeah. old lady. Yeah. But you know, as I became aware that I felt the information was really important, uh -huh. 
um, that's a must, you know? So it's in interesting that the old lady was some sort of a inner presence, yeah. an inner old lady that was being born. I think, yeah, she was. <laughs> yes, and someone once told me that when I first was started, a graduate student named Leah, a wonderful woman, she said, oh, this is a wonderful thing, and you'll be giving birth to yourself as a crone as you do it. Now, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. I had no idea what she meant. I'm not even sure she knew what she meant. Yeah. Actually, I've told her this, and she doesn't remember <laughs> even saying right. it, but um, that's really happened. So okay. I think that is exactly what happened. Wow. There was an, because we all are, Jung said we're multiplicities. We're not one thing. We're many, yeah. many, many right. things. And even when we're young, we have an old one resolving, residing in us. And when we're old, we have the young ones. Uh -huh. That's agelessness. Yeah, nice. We don't lose any age we've ever been. As we get old, we just add more. Yeah. So we can still visit that. Yeah, agelessness, in fact, is another thing that you've, Written right. about, I was giving it a whole chapter. Yeah. 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 It's it's not meant to be ageless in the sense of if we have enough facelifts and dye our hair, we can pass for forty and stay young. Uh huh. It's ageless in the sense. The phrase that came to me was, um, "We're women of all seasons," borrowing from Thomas More. Okay. Um, so that means that as older women, we're also still, we have moments of maidenness, motherness, childhood, all of that yeah. is still in us. So um, Ashton Applegate has written a, a wonderful book called This Chair Rocks, which is basically <laughs> a passionate manifesto about what she calls age fullness, which oh. means embrace old, and you know, and and watch your stereotyping and yeah. your ageist ideas. So it's it's ageless, but it's really all agedness. But that's another awkward term. So I just went with agelessness. Yeah, yeah. And there are many dimensions of this. A lot of the assumptions we make about old people that we're all demented, that we're frail and can barely get around, and mm -hmm. we're drooling and all those things, are really minority phenomena. I mean, the, the, the literature is really strong that only about 5% um, of elders live in nursing homes. And of the elders who aren't in nursing homes, only about 5% of those really need help with daily care. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of us age in healthy ways mm -hmm. and, until we need to die. And then yeah. we, we, we aren't so healthy at that point. But, and the same with dementia, serious dementia, severe dementia that really impacts our life and the lives of those around us is f over 65 is about one, 20 percent. So 80 yeah. percent not. It's a little older as we get even older. There's so much news about I Alzheimer's, know. et cetera, I know. that we're all sort of terrified, speaking for myself, yes. <laughs> that, uh, that that's where we're headed. Yeah. Any time we forget something. Mm -hmm. The other day I lost my keys at my son's house. And I went over and retrieved them. And bless her heart, my, my son's girlfriend, Emily, said, you know, I do that all the time. And she mm -hmm. proceeded to tell me this story yeah. of how the alarm had gone off in her car at 6 o'clock in the morning because they were retrieving her keys and the neighbors are texting. And that was so comforting to me to mm -hmm. remember that. And I remember as a young woman, I often lost my keys. So yeah. I think... Um, we often assume any forgotten thing, any odd little thing we do, we go into, oh my God, I'm losing it. Yeah. Dementia has set in. Yeah. It's far more likely that we are tired, we're stressed, we're multitasking and not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And yeah. those things make us not very smart at any age. One of the things I notice is that uh, I'm not good at multitasking. Yeah. Uh, it seems like I used to be able to, to do two things more or less at once. At least, <laughs> yeah. yes. Uh, and, uh, and now I'll get caught up in one and mm -hmm. be totally oblivious to that other thing. Mm -hmm. And then we forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Um, yeah. But in a way, that could be seen as um, forcing us to pay attention, right? You start to work on 
being in the moment. Yes. And say, okay, I got to focus on what I'm doing now and stop worrying about whatever the other thing was yes. that was on my mind. Right on. Yeah. So we get to be present, yeah. which is, I think, how we start out uh -huh. as little people. Yeah. And I think it's part of the goal uh -huh. of remembering to be here. Yeah, yeah. And savor what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Now you've got a chapter on remembrance. Yes. So, <laughs> Ironically. That, yeah, that yeah. fits in here somewhere. It does. Yeah. It, it does. How so? <laughs> yeah. Well, remembrance is, is, the, um, is basically the life review. It's um, those memory. We start to get a lot of very old memories coming to us as we mm -hmm. age, random moments. Mm -hmm. Remembering three and five and seven, mm -hmm. what happened at 12, that's a very natural process. And Robert Butler in the early 60s wrote about that as a very important psychological experience of reviewing our life and finding the meaning and cohesiveness in it. Yeah. It's a preparation for death. It also enlivens us. You know, as we sa re-savor the beauty of our life uh -huh. and come to terms mm -hmm. with our unfinished business. Mm -hmm. It's very enlivening. Now, prior to Butler, the idea was that old people live in the past and they're out of touch with reality and mm -hmm. it's just part of how sad it is to get old. And yeah. what we're now recognizing is it's very important work that people are doing uh -huh. in that remembering. Yeah. And I think what the other benefit of that, not just for ourselves, making peace with our life, which is no small thing, and who we are, mm -hmm. is that we begin to recognize what we have to share with the world. A lot of elders tell stories. I don't know if you notice that, but I certainly do. I tell my grandkids a lot of stories about the old days, yeah. which they happen to love, which is wonderful. Yeah, good. And I think part of that is passing on the things that we've learned the hard way it's planting seeds, you know, some of it's way over their head, but the, the heart of the story isn't, it goes right into their heart, I think. Uh -huh. And also hearing stories of how we've overcome things or people we know have overcome things lends courage to younger people because they, they are also dealing with a lot, especially these days. Yeah. 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 So I think that's part of the legacy that older people have, is in remembering our own life story, which is one version of the human journey of life, or the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. Not hero, hero, but that we've confronted the monsters and found allies and found gifts and brought them back to share. Yeah. That's really what remembrance is about. And this seems to lead into actually the final chapter of your book, which is about wisdom. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you've just been saying sounds like maybe components of wisdom. Yes. In yeah. fact, for me, wisdom is the crowning grace. Yeah, yeah. It takes all of those other pieces, I think. Wisdom is sometimes defined as the capacity to find the best way through an important complex situation that affects a lot of people usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those other graces, having a connection to your own power, having lived through lots of adversity, which is oddly part of contentment. Mm -hmm. There's some correlation between compassion and contentment and having had some hard things to deal with in your life. Yeah. A little bit of that is really good for us, actually. Well, all of us who uh, have the, the privilege, the gift of, of living through aging, of getting to be as old as yes. we are, because a lot of people aren't around anymore that, no, they aren't. that were before, right. uh, is the experience of, uh, is that we're veterans, we're survivors. Yeah. And so we've learned some things along the road. We have, yeah. we have. Yeah. 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 And some of the things we've learned, I think the world needs elders and perspective. Yeah. In a way, it has never needed it. That could be a good wrap up for this mm -hmm. interview here, unless there's something else you want to say. No, I think, I think I'm okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think this is a, a wonderful book that you've written, uh, you. full of wisdom. Thank and you. I encourage everybody to go out and get it. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs>